<laughs> Welcome back to Physics 272. Last time, last time was a long time ago, wasn't it? We've had October break and we didn't meet last week during this class, so let me remind you what happened two weeks ago in this class. We looked at the magnetic field of a straight wire, okay? And we saw that for the magnetic field of a straight wire, if we have current going in one particular direction, then we have a right-hand rule where we can put our thumb, right thumb, always use your right thumb, to point along the direction of conventional current. And then my fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field, which means that the magnetic field makes concentric circles around the wire. And then we also saw that if we had a current loop, so now let me have current running a particular direction in this wire. Same thing, I could put my thumb along the direction of the wire. The magnetic field curls along the direction of my finger. Okay, and then I curl it in a loop, and now what happens? Okay, so if current's going this direction, clockwise to you, then I put my thumb here, and magnetic field is always going through the middle of the, of the ring. So this is actually how you make an electromagnet. You make a loop of wire, or actually make several loops of wire to get a nice strong current, and then you get a very strong magnetic field coming through, and the shape of that magnetic field looks just like a permanent magnet. So that's, um, that's the magnetic field of a current loop. And we talked about magnetic dipole moments and also electron spin. We'll talk a little bit more about electron spin again. So today, we'll get into uh, bar magnets and a little bit of physics about how bar magnets work. All right, so we'll get into bar magnets and how bar magnets work and what it is inside of them that's causing those little magnets. It turns out that inside of a bar magnet, it's like having little electromagnets. Little nanoscale electromagnets are inside there. We'll talk about what does equilibrium mean. So what's equilibrium versus steady state in a circuit? And we'll try to think about what in the world is being used up in a circuit. Something must be being used up because to make this circuit work, I'm very familiar with this. You have to put batteries in these things. I have small children. We have lots of toys with batteries. We spend a lot of money per month on batteries or recharging them or whatever. So something must get used up because I keep having to buy batteries at the store to make these cute little electronic toys go. So something's used up. We'll figure out what it is. Um, we'll look at Kirchhoff's current node law, which is a really long way to say something that's actually very simple. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And we'll look at the electric field inside of a wire. But first, let's get back to the magnets. Anybody ever played with magnets? Yes. Everyone needs their own set of magnets. I never go anywhere without mine. I love my magnets. My boys, ages eight and five, also like to play with magnets. So we have that in common. So I have a bunch of little bar magnets here. And of course, they stack up together nicely. I'm going to get the little, <laughs> these guys out of the way. Oh, this is going to make a mess. All right, so I have a bunch of little bar magnets here. The magnetic balls are not part of the demonstration. But anyway, of course, as you know from playing with magnets, there's a particular direction that these guys like to go, right? If I get the direction wrong, they don't line up, right? They don't want to go together, right? So there's something going on inside these guys that makes them all line up. And actually, inside of a permanent magnet itself, if I look inside it, what it is that's causing the magnet. It's actually, okay, thanks. It's actually little electromagnets inside, okay? So we said that if I take a current loop of wire, it makes a little magnet, right? This is what's going on inside of a real material. So when you have a material that's magnetic, the electrons inside are making little current loops. And as they make their little current loops, they make a little nanoscale magnet associated with that. That's one source of the magnetism inside the material. There's another source, which is that the electron itself, and this is weird quantum mechanics stuff, the electron itself seems to be a little electromagnet to itself. Okay, so the, 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 it's, as though, it's as though the electron were a ball of charge spinning if I had a big spinning ball of charge, that's also like a little current loop, and it would make a magnetic field. Okay? The electron, as far as we can tell, has no size, so that's not actually what's going on. But it is as though the electron is doing that, because it's creating its own little magnetic field. We call that the electron spin, because it looks a little bit like the electron is spinning on its axis. So those two sources of magnetism at the atomic scale that happen in real materials, 
One is each electron has its own little spin associated with it. The other is that as the electron goes around its atom, it makes a current loop. And a current loop makes a magnetic moment. So the trick is not getting magnetism in the material. The trick is to get them to all line up. Okay? In most materials, these little magnetic moments are pointing in all sorts of different ways. So kind of like if I took my, my toy magnets here and just had them kind of crumple up and point all in different directions. You can't quite see that very well. But if I had them crumple up and point all in different directions, the, the, the sum total of these guys is not producing a very large magnetic field because they're all pointing in different directions. So most materials are kind of like this. They're all pointing in different directions. But when you have a permanent magnet, then the atomic scale magnets actually all um, line up, okay, kind of like this. And then they line up and reinforce each other, and that gives you a net permanent um, magnet. In fact, what I think is, is pretty cool about this is there's an actual phase transition associated with this lining up. Okay? So phases of matter. Just tell me some phases of matter. What do you know? What's a phase of matter? Solid? Gas? I heard liquid. Anything else? Plasma? OK. All right. And um, we don't really make a sharp distinction between gas and plasma, but yeah, it gets, it gets listed. Anybody have an LCD display somewhere? You have an, anybody have an iPhone, something like that? OK, you have an LCD display. LC stands for liquid crystal. It's something that's liquid in one direction, crystal in another. There's tons of phases of matter beyond solid liquid gas. It turns out that this net lining up of magnetic moments counts as another phase of matter. So let me tell you why, OK? If I take this magnetic material, if I take, take a permanent magnet, and let's put it in a really hot oven, hotter than your kitchen oven, OK? So put it in a, in a kiln. And if you raise the temperature on your little ferromagnet, at some point you raise the temperature enough, the thing will melt. Okay? And you would recognize that as a phase transition. You would look at it and say, oh, my magnet turned into a puddle. It melted from solid into liquid. Okay? But at a much lower temperature than that, around 1500 Fahrenheit, when I raise the temperature on this magnet, all of a sudden, bam, the magnetism is gone. Even though you would look at it by eye and say, it doesn't look like anything happened. Looks like it's, it's still intact. It's still a solid. But there's a well-defined temperature at which, bam, the magnetism goes away. And then if you cool the material again, bam, the magnetism comes back. And what's going on in those materials is that at low temperature, all the little atomic scale magnets line up. Bam, they all line up. That gives you the net magnetism. And then as you raise the temperature on this thing, think of my fingers as the little magnetic moments that are inside the solid. As you raise temperature, what, what happens to solids as you raise the temperature on them? Vibration. There's vibrations, there's wiggling, they get excited, right? So everything just kind of jiggles, okay, according to temperature. So, so, you know, we look at these solids and they look like they're not moving to us. They're, they're moving. There's lots of jiggling and wiggling going on inside. And if you're, uh, if you're thinking about these magnetic moments on the atoms, the atoms are jiggling and wiggling due to temperature, and the magnetic moments kind of start wiggling around too. And there's a well-defined temperature at which, bam, there's just no order to it anymore. They're all pointing in all different directions and wiggling and wiggling, and there's no net magnetism. And then if you lower the temperature again, bam, they all come back and line up again. So that's an actual phase transition because there's a real temperature at which it happens. There's a sharp temperature. It's called the Curie temperature. And it's a phase transition, though, not of the atoms in the solid. It's a phase transition that the electrons go through. So the electrons inside the solid go through a real, actual phase transition at that magnetic temperature. That's my field of physics, by the way. I study phases of matter and phase transitions, but of electrons, what electrons do inside materials. So again, in most materials, they're not lining up. In ferromagnets at low enough temperature, okay, below their Curie temperature, which is typically a high number like 1500 uh, Fahrenheit, um, they all line up and make magnetic material. Now, there's something you should know though. Uh, if you go looking for a ferromagnetic, it's it, a permanent magnet is sometimes called a ferromagnet. If you go looking for that kind of material out in the wild, anybody here a geologist go hunting for rocks? Or did it as a hobby, okay, something like that. All right, so if you're a geologist and you're out capturing rocks in the wild, wild rocks, and you found a hunk of what should have been a permanent magnet, probably when you pick it up, it's not got a net magnetization to it. Probably it's much more like this picture, where inside the rock there's little pieces that are pointing all together and little pieces that are pointing all together but in a different direction, okay? There's actually a good physics reason for that, which is that. If you've ever played at length with one of these little 
magnet um, toys, all right, and you can try it out yourself. Um, if you start trying to stack these guys up and make long lengths out of them, okay? So if I try to stack them up next to each other like this, all right, what you'll find is that there are certain stable configurations, okay? And then if I go flipping the north-south poles, that'll change the stability of it, okay? And if you start trying to add them up together, then what you find, okay, let me at least get three of these together. All right, so you see how these are all aligned. Let me take the three and compare to the three, okay? North is up, okay? If I put these guys next to each other like this, they actually don't quite like each other. Can you guys kind of see that in the front row? They don't really quite like each other. But just pull it off and, and align it like this. They actually more prefer that way, okay? So that this guy on the left has north-south this way, and this guy has north pointing down. Did you, did you see what happened there? Okay, they didn't like this, but they like that. So, so as um, a ferromagnetic material is cooling, it actually tends to form domains for that reason. And if you've played at length with these little magnetic toys, you, you know that. So then you have this question of, well, how do you get, how does somebody sell me a permanent magnet then? Okay, even if kind of on small scales, the little magnetic moments tend to line up, but then they tend to flip their neighbors. Um, how, how is it that somebody sells me a permanent magnet? The way they make those is they take them up to a very high temperature, high enough that all the magnetic moments are pointing all over the place due to temperature, and then they apply a large magnetic field. And that large magnetic field kind of aligns all the magnetic moments, and now you cool it down below the phase transition temperature, the ferromagnetic phase transition temperature. And if you get it cold enough, now you can take off your external field, and now everything's stuck pointing on the same direction. So permanent magnets have been trained by what's called field cooling. You cool them in, um, whoo, I'm going to move that so that doesn't happen again. You cool them in a net magnetic field and then they all point in the same direction. Do you have any questions about that sort of physics? Okay. All right. So this is the, the, this is the graph that goes along with what I was talking about that um, inside of the material, right, inside of the material, um, if I have everything all pointing in the same direction like this, there's actually a little bit of tendency on, on long length scales for this guy to want to flip and point so that its north is facing down. And it's because this guy is making a magnetic field that goes this way, right? Its magnetic moment puts a, a field that way, which tends to cause this guy to not want to align but flip over. So to really get a true permanent magnet, you have to, you have to field cool them. Um, all right. So now, did you have any other questions about magnetism? You can ask me after class, too. Clearly, I like magnets a lot. Um, so we're going to move on to chapter 19. Chapter 19 is about electric circuits. And of course, there's a lot to learn here. We're going to learn about surface charges on the circuit that actually help drive the current. We'll see how that happens. And um, about some transient effects. We'll, we need to learn the difference, too, between what's called steady state and equilibrium. And today we'll talk about the current node rule, which is kind of a fancy way of saying that what comes in must come out. So here are some things we'd like to consider inside of a, a circuit that's working. All right. Um, some of the questions we want to ask on the very small scale, when we say microscopic, we mean the very small scale. We want to ask what's going on inside the circuit. Are the charges being used up somehow? What is it that's going on? Exactly how does a current carrying wire um, maintain the electric field that's necessary to keep the electrons flowing, and I'll, I'll tell you what we mean by that. And we want to understand the role of the battery. So let me remind you um, how we talk about current. Okay? There's something called conventional current. In conventional current, the, the direction of conventional current is as though the current were carried by positively charged particles. Okay? That's what conventional current is all about. And we pretend that there are positively charged particles that pop off the positive terminal of a battery and run around the circuit and come back and enter it at the negative terminal. What's really going on microscopically is that current is carried by electrons in real materials. So in fact, electrons, which are negatively charged, are popping off the negative terminal going through the circuit and popping back in the positive terminal. Now, we also need to think about equilibrium versus steady state. In, so far, we've discussed a lot about equilibrium. Okay? Equilibrium is where inside of a, of a, a current-carrying material, so, well, inside of a material that can conduct, so inside of a conductor, like a metal, 
the electrons have net uh, zero velocity. That's what equilibrium means. There's no current flowing. And if I, on average, average the velocity of all the electrons, it comes to zero. Um, current flow is not equilibrium. It's called steady state. So what we mean by steady state is that there's a particular current in the system, but the current isn't changing. Okay? Now, <clears throat> think inside of a, of a material and think of the electrons inside of a metal. The electrons inside of a metal are liquid-like, and uh, your book refers to it as the electron C because it really is like a, a, a sea of, of liquid particles. And even in this equilibrium condition, in equilibrium when there's no current flowing and there's no net average velocity to the electrons, they're actually still moving, they're liquid, okay? So they're actually moving around. It's just that there's no net current associated with that. It's kind of like a big mosh pit, okay? They're, they're, they're doing stuff, but there's no net movement to the crowd. That's um, equilibrium, okay? If there's no average movement to everything. Current flow is not equilibrium. It's where that big mosh pit of electrons just kind of moves all en masse together. And you can say, ah, now there's a crowd going by. There's an average number of electrons per second going by. And if that average number of electrons per second going by is unchanging, then we call that steady state, where there's an average drift velocity of the electrons, which is constant. Do you have any questions about the difference between equilibrium and steady state? Okay, equilibrium is just no net flow of electrons. Um, steady state is where there is a net flow of the electrons, current, but the current is not changing. Here we have a clicker pole. A clicker pole is where you just get points for pushing a button. And we want to ask this question. Let's say that we have current flowing in this circuit. And I want to ask the question, how would you expect the amount of current at location 1 to compare to the current at location 2? Would you expect that there's no current at 2 since the light bulb used it up? Would you expect that there's less current at 2 than 1 since <coughs> some of it gets converted to light and heat given off by the bulb? Or would you expect that the current at 2 is the same as the current at 1? All right, and this is just an opinion poll, so we're just, it's, it's just for fun. But what are you thinking about this problem? What, how should we think about it? Do we think that there's no current at 2, there's less current at 2, the current is the same in both cases. What are some of the things we need to consider? What are some of the lines of reasoning we need to go through here? Yes? OK, all right. So if you've already learned Kirchhoff's current rule, then you know that current in is equal to the current out. And then that tells you what? <clears throat> OK, so that's going to give you that the answer C. What, what else do we need to think about? If you haven't learned Kirchhoff's current rule yet, how, what's, a, what's a line of reasoning we need to go through to think about this? Yeah, please. OK, all right. So, so he's saying if, you, if you're familiar with the loop rules of how current works, then what comes in comes back out again. And so uh, what are, did I get it right? OK. OK, and you'd say that there's a voltage drop across this guy, but not necessarily a current. Um, <clears throat> Are there other things we should think about? I mean, something's being used up, right? So you're saying there's voltage. What is, and so if we think, let's think, let's think microscopically. Let's pretend that you didn't know yet the, current, the, the Kirchhoff's current rules. And if we think microscopically about what's going on, something's going on here, right? My light bulb's lighting up. But if we think about this possibility that, well, OK, let's say you didn't know Kirchhoff's current laws. And you said, well, there's current coming in. Something's getting used up. What if the electrons are getting used up, right? So if I'm trying to put things through and I'm thinking, well, maybe this bulb is somehow converting electrons. Well, we can't destroy electrons. So we're, not, we're not allowed to do that. We can't destroy net charge, that is. So we can't do that. We could think that, well, if there's more current coming in than going out, what's really going on, if I think of these guys as like a crowd of electrons coming by and a crowd of electrons coming out, and this is like a store with a sale going on or something, OK? So electrons are coming in, electrons are going out. But if there's, a, if there's a difference, right, if more current's coming in than it's coming out, then there's a crowd building up in the light bulb, right? So then there'd be electrons gathering and electrons gathering and electrons gathering. And that's not, can't be what's happening because um, electrons um, <laughs> repel each other, right? And so if I let that go on long enough and if I thought that the bulb was actually just gathering up electrons and gathering up electrons, eventually the sucker will explode, OK? Um, and actually, we have a little. Experiment here. We'll hook up this light bulb over here. 
and it's not exploding, okay? So it's not gathering electrons. Another thing you could think about as well, if, you know, if it were eating up electrons somehow or gathering them in order to cause this to happen, then eventually it would get negatively charged and repel the electrons trying to come in. So, um, so as you guys pointed out, look, what goes in has to come out. And so this means that the current at position two has to be the same as the current at position one. Um, this was a pole anyway, so I'm just going to close it. All right, the bulb must be using something up though, right? And we said it's, it's not consuming electrons, right? The bulb is not an electron eater, much, 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 much. Okay? The, uh, um, can the bulb, you know, consume current as electrons accumulate in the bulb? No. If it were accumulating electrons, not only would it get enough electrons eventually to explode, but it'll get negatively charged and it'll repel any electrons trying to come in. So that's not what's going on. So what the bulb is using up is it's converting energy from one form to another, all right? So the chemical energy stored in the battery gets converted into light energy and heat energy. Um, and it's very much like a, a water wheel. So it, I like to think in terms of, of analogies for electric circuits. And if we think of the current flowing as being like water flowing through, it's like I have a river going by a mill, and I'm using the current of the river to do something inside the mill, like grind grain, something like that. But I'm not using up the water, right? The water comes by, turns the wheel, and then goes on through, right? What I'm doing is I'm siphoning off some of the kinetic energy of the river to drive the mill. But I'm not in the business of gathering water, right? So just like this, what goes in must come out. So current comes in, current goes out. We're just converting energy from one form to another. And actually, um, what's going on inside of, of light bulbs, it depends on which kind of bulb you have, of course. This is one of the old school incandescent bulbs that um, actually uh, takes a lot more energy to produce the same amount of light than, say, our uh, more energy efficient compact fluorescent bulb up here. These guys use about 20% of the electricity these guys need to give the same light. If I really wanted to be cutting edge, I would have put an LED bulb up here, okay? Because those use about 5% of the electricity that these guys need. But let me at least tell you how these incandescent guys work. The incandescent bulbs, inside of them have uh, a tiny tungsten filament, and the tungsten filament um, has a little spiral in it, and inside the spiral is a little spiral. So it's a little spiral of a spiral of a spiral, okay? It's a very thin wire, and there's a lot of it packed together, and we're driving current through it, and what happens is that you can see that some of the energy is getting converted into light, okay? In this case, though, a lot of it's actually getting converted into heat. These guys, incandescent bulbs, glow because of their temperature. It's just a temperature thing, okay? And in fact, you, you may not know this, but, but I'm glowing. Can you see it? Okay, I have a temperature too, and I glow. Has anybody ever used night vision goggles? I love night vision goggles. Cool, all right. Yeah, okay, in the, in the first lecture, I, I asked this question, and the entire ROTC section raised their hands. Yeah, we use night vision goggles all the time. It's an argument for joining ROTC. Anyway, when you're using night vision goggles, what you're seeing is this glow, okay, but it's, it's um, Everything glows based on its temperature. Things that are lower temperature, like I'm a lower temperature than the bulb, I glow too. You just can't see the light coming off me because your eyes can't detect it. But if you put on night vision goggles, now you have a way to detect what's called that infrared light that's coming off of, of other warm objects. So why, <laughs> why does that happen? All right, let's remember what we think about when we think about electrons going through a solid, right? So in the analogy we used before, it's like these desks in here are like the atomic cores inside of a metal, okay? So your desks are the atomic cores, and if I'm an electron trying to move along a solid in the right way, all I have to do is look out over, you guys have a regular arrangement of desks, right? And I could, I'm not going to do it, everybody's getting a little nervous up here, but I could get up on top of the desks and tick, 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 run across the top of the desks. That's how electrons move inside of a material. Um, they, they look out and they see what periodicity they need, and then they just tick, 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 run along, uh, at the right periodicity, and that's how they move through so easily. Now, let's say, let's say we're actually gonna, I'm gonna make you guys a little more nervous. Um, so let's say I'm running this direction. Do you mind if I pick on you? He's like, I'm never sitting here again. Okay, what's, what's your name? Bart. Oh no, say it again. Bart. Bart, yeah, okay, whew, <laughs> Bart. 
Thank you. So let's say I'm going to do this. I'm going to run around along the desk, and I'm going to get the right rhythm, like an electron inside of a solid. But then Parth is going to, um, you play football? Yeah. He's going to sack me, OK? Bam. Because what's going to happen is that he, in a real material, right, even though the electron could sneak through just by getting the right rhythm, right? I could pick the right rhythm and run that direction. I could pick the right rhythm and run that direction, and so forth. If there's something out of place, then I will smack into it, and I'll lose all my kinetic energy, and I'd smack into Parth. I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, but Parth. And I'd give my kinetic energy to him, OK? And then I'd have to pick up again and start running again. So inside of a real material, there's temperature. And you already told me that temperature causes everything to wiggle. So think of all these desks not as being perfectly still, but with a particular temperature. They wiggle, they wiggle, they wiggle. So if I'm an electron running along, what will happen is that I get the right rhythm. That's OK. As long as the desks all stay perfectly still, I'd be fine. But every once in a while, I encounter a desk out of place. Okay? And I run into Parth, and bam, I, I, I give him my kinetic energy, and then I'd have to pick up again and start running. So every time the electron smacks into something out of place, it loses its kinetic energy, gives it to the atoms, all right, and then it keeps dumping that energy into the atoms, and the atoms wiggle more and wiggle more, and, that, and so they have a higher and higher temperature. That's why this guy's lighting up. It's because electrons, as they go through it, are whacking into the atoms that are out of place, Every time they whack in, they dump a bunch of energy into it, which raises the temperature. And this is actually very hot. Okay? It's glowing so much that it's white. Has anybody used um, the kind of, of eye on a stove that's got that little spiral on it? When you turn it on, it glows red. Okay? All right. It's just glowing because it's hot. Okay? We're all glowing because we're hot. You just can't see it with your eyes. You need night vision goggles. A stove top glows red. It's hotter than us. This is glowing white because it's putting off red and orange and yellow and green and blue. So it's got a lot higher energy than your stove top. And if, if I had this even being hotter and hotter and hotter, it would eventually turn blue because it would start glowing in the ultraviolet, things that we can't detect, which are even higher energy. Um, so this actually, this actually tells you a little bit about the color of stars. But anyway, so in here, the electron energy is getting converted into light and heat. Okay. So that's where the energy is going. But it's a bit, again, like this water wheel. It's not like the electrons are used up, right? They go through the circuit. They come back, all right? So they don't go away. It's just that their, their kinetic energy is getting converted into light and heat. Now, I like this analogy for electric potential and height. So let's think, for example, which I'm just reminding you of an analogy that we've already used before, which is that voltage or potential is a bit like height. And a positive charge moving in that potential landscape is a bit like a ball. So uh, a positive charge will move along the potential landscape, much like a ball rolling down a hill. And in any given spot, the ball wants to roll a particular direction downhill. That's the direction that the electric field points right there. It's whatever direction the ball would actually want to roll on that landscape. Now we can take that height analogy even further and think about it in terms of circuits. So here's what it looks like for circuits. Um, I like this water analogy because it gives you, gives you kind of a physical intuition for what's going on. So on the left-hand side, I have what's going on in a circuit. On the right-hand side, I have what would happen in water pipes. And we've just compared the two, all right? So the circuit will compare to a bunch of water pipes. Uh, rumor has it that this picture here, which is a bunch of water pipes, is Google's cooling system. So anyway, uh, blue would be the cold water coming in. Red would be the hot water coming off. Um, positive charge is like water flowing. Okay? Current, conventional current, is like the water flowing through the pipes. All right? And then I need something to drive the water flow. Well, in a system of pipes, what's typically driving the water flow is just gravity fed. Okay? So I have water just flowing downstream in the pipes. Um, so height is like voltage there. And if I want to move water back up, I need some sort of pump. So the pump is like a battery, right? The battery is like a pump, I guess, is what I'm really trying to say. Now, let's think about this. Let's have a tub of water. Let's have a gravity-fed water system where I have a big tub of water on, on the roof of the house. And I'm going to have two pipes coming out of it. I'm going to have a skinny pipe and a big pipe. Which one has more water flowing through it when I open all the valves? The skinny pipe or the big pipe? Big pipe has more water running through it. Okay, so in our analogy, resistance is a little bit like one over the pipe diameter. So 
Um, if I have a skinny pipe, it's harder to flow the water through it. That's like a high resistance element in your uh, circuit. So something that's high resistance has less current flowing through it in the same way that a skinny pipe would have less water flowing through it. Um, electric potential energy is like gravitational potential energy in that um, analogy, which is the same way of saying voltage is like height. Um, there's a current node rule in electrical circuits, just like there's an, a rule in water pipes, right? If I have water pipes, and I think about, let's say, this junction here, look at these blue pipes. I have a big pipe up top, and then I have two other pipes coming off of it. Just like water in pipes, what water comes in must come out, right? So when I see a junction like this, I know a certain amount of water comes in, and it all has to come back out on the other side. So that is the same as the current node rule. Um, the voltage loop rule would be that in any circuit, as I go around a closed loop in the circuit and come back, I must come back to the same voltage. In the same way, if I trace these water pipes out, and I start off up here, and I don't see any closed loops on the diagram, but if I imagine the, the, the pipe going underground and coming back up here to the blue part, when I go around a closed loop in the pipes, I come back to the same height, right? I have to. So I come back to the same height. It's like coming back to the same voltage in the circuit. And a high resistance element in your circuit is like a skinny pipe. A low resistance element is like a, a fat pipe. So I like this analogy a lot. It gives you intuition about how to think about how electrons flow through a circuit. One of the reasons this works so well is that the electrons inside of a metal are liquid. They're liquid-like. So they really do flow around much like water flowing through um, pipes. Do you have any questions about the analogy so far? OK. All right. So if we think in terms of that analogy, then Kirchhoff's current law, or the current node rule, simply becomes what goes in must come out. OK. So a node is any junction in your circuit where two or more wires come together. So here I have one wire coming in to what I've called a node and one wire coming out. It's a very simple junction. And if I put four amps in, right, let's put four amps in here, what do you think is going to come out on the other side if what goes in must come out? What's on the other side? Yeah, four amps, four amps on the other side, OK? What goes in must come out, just like water flowing through pipes. Let's make it a little bit more complicated, OK? So now I have a circuit where current's going to come in here. There's a node now with three pieces coming out, OK? And I'll have four amps coming in just like before, but now I have three pieces coming out. Let's say up top I measure and I find, well, there's one amp coming out here, two amps coming out here. What's going to come out of the other spot? Yeah, there's one amp left. So what goes in must come out. And what goes in must come out, just like water flowing through tributaries in, in a river system. So that's it. That's Kirchhoff's current law, or sometimes it's called the current node rule, which is a bunch of words for just saying what goes in must come out. It really is just that simple. Okay? And your job on the homeworks is just to put math to that idea. Do you have any questions about the concept? Okay. Current comes in, current must come out. Got it? All right. Does, does no questions mean we're good? Good? Go on? OK. All right. See him thumbs up. Good. Now, in the, inside the material itself, there must be something that's driving the current, right? Because if I go back to, to scaring people up here, if I go back to thinking about, well, what is it like to be an electron inside of a material, right? This is what it's like to be an electron inside of a material. I, I'm the electron. You guys are the atoms. And I look out and I see this regular arrangement. Okay? And I'm going to try to run a particular direction by getting the rhythm right and running that direction. <laughs> but I'm going to have all these collisions. Because in the real world, the atoms have a particular temperature. They're moving about. And as they're moving about and wiggling, I'll be expecting to run at a particular rhythm. But one of the desks will wiggle out of the way, and bam, I'll fall. And when I fall, I'm going to give all that kinetic energy to the atoms. And so that's this chick, chick, chick uh, graph up there. That's what that's showing, is that as the electron runs along, OK, it's running along, it runs along. Bam, it whacks into something. It loses all its kinetic energy and gives it to the lattice. And bam, it has no speed again. Then it's got to pick up again, and zip, it starts running again. The reason it keeps going and keeps picking itself up, poor little electron, picks itself up, dusts itself off, and starts running again, is because there's an electric field kicking it along. Kick, 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 kick. So there must be an electric field applied. If I take the electric field off, all the electrons will run into something and just stop. 
really quickly, you know, in about 10 to the minus 12 seconds, all the current will go away. I've got to keep pushing them, push, 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 push. Otherwise, they just fall down and don't get back up again. So there has to be an electric field applied constantly, continuously to keep this current going. And under that constant electric field condition, then this is what the, the average speed of electrons will look like. It'll uh, go up linearly with time, right? Because there's a constant force applied to the electrons. So it'll accelerate, 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 bam, run into something. Accelerate, 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 bam, run into something. So I need something to keep getting those guys to move through the wire. OK, so here's what's going on inside the wire. We've already figured out that what goes in must come out. So inside of a wire, there's, there's current in the steady state situation. Whatever the current is here is the current here is the current there. All right. And if I put equations to this, so let's put equations to this idea. The current in the wire is like QNAV. Let me remind you what all those symbols mean. Q is the magnitude of the charge on each um, charged particle that's carrying the current. So uh, little n is number of particles per unit volume. It's just the density of carriers in there. Um, a is the cross-sectional area of the wire. Notice that, like we said, with the, with the fat pipes and the skinny pipes, a, a fat wire carries more current, just like you would expect. And then there's this V, average velocity of the electrons. We derived that equation a few lectures ago. The average velocity of, of the electrons is something called the mobility times the electric field applied. And this mobility is just a number associated with the material. You look it up. Or if you're really good, you can calculate it. But you can look it up, what, what it is for a particular material. So if you have copper, you would look up the mobility of copper. And then you could tell me, OK, if I apply a particular electric field, you multiply this known number, the mobility of copper, then you can tell me the average drift velocity of the electrons. So feeding this into this equation, I get that the total current is Q times uh, the density of electrons times the cross-sectional area times mobility times the applied field. Okay? And all of that was just to show you the equations that go along with what we said intuitively, which is that if I have a constant current in a material, I have to have an electric field driving it. Okay? Do you have any questions so far? Yeah. Um, oh, you want to know where the time is in here. The time in here is hiding in the velocity. The velocity has Velocity has meters, per, yeah, I, I, I love it. This is exactly how you should be thinking is, where are all the units? <laughs> so the units here, there's charge. The velocity has the per second to it. Um, the area and the velocity have three powers of length in them, right? Area is meters squared. Velocity has a meters in it. This density here is per volume, which has three powers of meters in it. So the meters all cancel, and this becomes charge per second. Excellent question. That's exactly how, how we want you to be thinking about these things. So altogether, when I put the equation together, I see that the current is directly proportional to the applied electric field. What that means, oh, I left my circuit on, hmm, draining the batteries. What that means is that in order for this light bulb to be glowing here, can you guys see that OK in the back? I apologize. It's kind of dim. Can anyone in the back see the light bulb glowing? All right. So what, what that means is that, all right, there's current flowing through this circuit. OK? And uh, if, I, uh, if I think about, well, what's, what's going on, all right, let me think in terms of electron current. I, I find that more physical microscopically. So I've got current coming in, current coming out. And what that means is that there's a current here. It's the same current here. It's the same current here. It's the same current here. Doesn't even matter if I bend the wires, right? It's the same current no matter what I do. And yet, microscopically inside the material, we know, based on what it's like to be an electron inside of a material, we know there must be some electric field pushing this guy along. Okay, So how's that happening, right? I mean, you know, I have to think about what's the source. How in the world does this wire have inside of it an electric field pointing this direction? All right, What's going on there? What are the sources of electric field I might have? Well, I could think about the battery. right? The battery has a positive terminal and a negative terminal. So the battery itself is like a dipole. The battery is putting out a dipole electric field. All right? But this bulb is not, the, the electrons over here are not directly responding to that dipole field. Right? And you can tell that by just, if I try to put the bulb closer to the battery, as long as I hold all the connections steady, then it's not, it's not driven by 
that electric field directly, okay? Something as local is going on. There's a local electric field right here that's driving that current, and there's a lo local electric field inside that's driving that current as well. So what we want to think about is how, right? So what's the source of electric field? What, I mean, what, what, generally speaking, what do we know in this class? If I see an electric field, it's caused by what? what? There's charges somewhere, right? There must be charges somewhere. So we've just figured out that for this guy to really work, there must be some point charges all along the wire that are causing this to happen. So the next thing we have to figure out is, well, what's, what's the configuration that would cause this kind of picture? If there's constant current, there must be some sort of electric field that's always pointing along the wire and yet has the same magnitude throughout the wire. Okay? And then the thing we have to figure out is, well, Okay, that must mean that there are charges along here that are driving that. But the electric field points in the same direction, and it actually, it turns out it's the same throughout the cross-section of the wire. We want to find this out. Where are the charges? There must be some charge there in order to drive, in order to cause this electric field. And here's what's going on. Okay, if I look microscopically, so this is a chunk of wire, all right? And if I look microscopically at what's going on in, in this circuit here, red is positive. Red's coming off the positive terminal, terminals of the battery. Black is going back into the negative terminals. So let's think from the negatively charged side, because um, electrons are a little easier to think about microscopically. So from the negative side of the battery, there's negative charges there. Okay? Some of those negative charges leak out onto the surface of the conductor. If I, um, I'm not going to do this right now, but you know what happens if I cut a wire and look inside, right? There's insulation on the outside. And then there's a copper core. So basically, from the, the negative terminal of the battery, there's electrons leaking out. And they all go on the surface of the copper wire. And they distribute themselves in such a way so as to maintain a constant electric field along this wire. So there's, there's negative charge here, but there's a little bit less charge here. There's a little less charge here. And as I move farther and farther from the battery, there's a little bit less charge and a little bit less charge, OK? all the way until I get to here. I happened to put this, you can't quite see it because they're tangled, but it's the same length of wire on both of these guys. All right. So if I think from the positive terminal side, the positive terminal side has positive charges. There's a little bit of net positive charge as I move out along the wire away from the battery. There's a little bit of net positive charge on the surface of the wire. Okay. It's because some of the electrons have moved away and exposed the atoms. But I have this net positive charge, and there's less. As I move away from the battery, there's less and less and less. Okay? But what's, what's going on is this picture. All along the wire, there's a little bit of surface charge on the outside of the copper. And so here, for example, I have a little bit of net negative charge, and I have a little bit more net negative charge over here. Okay? That makes a net electric field inside the wire that's pointing in the direction so as to push uh, the current along. Okay? So it's all driven actually by, by surface charges on the wire. Do you have any questions about that idea? That's the, that's the, the basic idea there. Okay? And so what Pardon? Yeah, OK, so let's think about. Think about what would happen if I have on a tube here, this is the wire, all right? If I have some surface charges on the outside of it here, put some electrons on the outside here, put some more electrons on the outside here, there's a net electric field pointing to the right. It's probably easier if we think, pretend these are positive charges, okay? If there's positive charges, it becomes pretty clear. So there would be a net electric field inside the wire driven by those rings of charge. So what we want to think about is all along the wire, on the surface of it, there's a ring of charge here, and there's a ring of charge here, and there's a ring of charge here. And that char the difference in charge from ring to ring is what tells you which direction the electric field points in anywhere in, in the wire. <clears throat> and then the ring of charge stays on the wire, right? So as I bend the wire, it's no, it's no big deal. It's just I'm looking at the change in the surface ring charge from here to here. That gives me a net electric field. And it's obviously on the, on the wire, it's smooth, right? It's just, there's just a smooth distribution of charge. It's just that towards the positive end of the battery, the surface charges are positive. And then there's less density of positive charge as I move away from the battery. Okay? And then as I come out from the negative side, there's a surface charge, there's a surface negative charge near the battery. And as I move away from the battery, there's less density of surface negative charge as I come away. But all those surface charges are the thing that locally cause there to be an electric field 
inside the wire driving the current. Did that kind of help? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any other, other questions about what that is that's going on? Okay. You, we, even without talking microscopically though, right? That was, the, that was the microscopic idea for all this stuff. But even without talking microscopically, we know that if the current's constant inside the wire, there must be an electric field that always points parallel to the wire inside of it and is always the same magnitude everywhere. Okay? So that's, that's the thing that you know for sure. It's that it turns out that it's these surface charges on the wire that locally are setting up that electric field. I mean, how does the wire know to get, well, how does it have an electric field right there? It's surface charges on the wire that are causing that electric field. Okay. Do you have any more questions about that? So here, for example, this is a battery okay, with a circuit around it. And this is uh, a diagram of what I was talking about. There are surface charges here, less surface charge here, less surface charge, and so on. That's what's setting up the electric field. Okay? All right, we're done for today. I'll see you on Wednesday. So why, why does that happen? All right, let's remember what we think about when we think about electrons going through a solid, right? So in the analogy we used before, it's like these depths in here are like the atomic cores inside of a metal, okay? So your depths to the atomic cores, and if I'm an electron trying to move along a solid in the right way, all I have to do is look out over, you guys have a regular arrangement of desks, right? And I could, I'm not going to do it, I'm just getting a little nervous up here, but I could get up on top of the desk and tick, 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 run across the top of the desk. That's how electrons move inside of a material. Um, they, they look out and they see what periodicity they need, and then they just run along uh, at the right periodicity, and that's how they move through so easily. Now, let's say, let's say we're actually going to, going to make you guys a little nervous. Um, so let's say I'm running this direction. Do you want to cut it on you? He's like, I'm never sitting here again. What, what's your name? Bob. Oh, no. Say it again. Bob. Bob. Yeah. Okay. Whew. Bob. Thank you. So let's say I'm going to do this. I'm going to run around along the desk, and I'm going to get the right rhythm, like an electron inside the solid. But then Park is going to um, play football. He's going to sack me. Okay? Fair. Because what's going to happen is that he, in a real material, right, even though the electrons can sneak through just by getting the right rhythm, right, I can pick the right rhythm and run that direction, I can pick the right rhythm and run that direction, and so forth. If there's something out of place, then I will smack into it, and I'll lose all my kinetic energy, and I smack into part, and sorry, I'm not getting for the part, and I give my kinetic energy to him, okay? And then I have to pick up again and start running again. So inside of a real material, there's temperature, and you already told me that temperature causes everything to wiggle. So think of all these desks, not as being perfectly still, but with a particular temperature, they wiggle, they wiggle, they wiggle. So if I'm an electron running along, what will happen is that I get the right rhythm, that's okay. As long as the desks all stay perfectly still, I'd be fine. But every once in a while, I encounter a desk out of place, okay? And I run into part, and bam, I, I, I give him my kinetic energy, and then I'd have to pick up again and start running. So every time the electron smacks into something out of place, it loses its kinetic energy, gives it to the atoms, all right, and then it keeps dumping that energy into the atoms, and the atoms wiggle more, wiggle more, and that, and so they have a higher and higher temperature. That's why this guy's lighting up. It's because electrons, as they go through it, are whacking into the atoms that are out of place. Every time they whack in, they dump a bunch of energy into it, which raises the temperature, and this is actually very hot, okay? It's glowing so much that it's current, right? So if I go back to, to scaring people up here, if I go back to thinking about well, what is it like to be an electron inside of a material, right? This is what it's like to be an electron inside of a material. I, I'm the electron, you guys are the atoms, and I look up and I see this regular arrangement, okay? And I'm going to try to run a particular direction by getting the rhythm right and running that direction. But I'm going to have all these collisions. Because in the real world, the atoms have a particular temperature and they're moving about, and as they're moving about and wiggling, I'll be expecting to run in a particular rhythm, but one of the desks will wiggle out of the way, and bam, I'll fall. And when I fall, I'm going to give all that kinetic energy to the atoms. And so that's this uh, graph up there. That's what that's showing, is that as the electron runs along, okay, it's running along, running along, 